get ready for practice. We got rained out today. So just, uh, you know, trying to make the most out of the day, you know. So will you push to a doubleheader tomorrow then? Yeah, we'll be playing two tomorrow uh, and then one Saturday. Our conference doesn't play on Easter Sunday. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, so, I mean, it actually, it works out better because, like, then you don't, we don't have our guy coming on one day less rest, you know? Yes. Yep. Will, so, will, you do, and they, will you do anything with the team for Easter? Um, No, not really. And, you know, some of the guys that are from out of the area, they'll go with some of the guys on the team. Um, Our guys are pretty good with, you know, the parents invite the kids that aren't flying home, let's say. Yep. You know what I mean? I actually so see- good. And a lot of parents... Be honest with you, being that we're home, a lot of parents are in this weekend to spend like the weekend in New York. Yep. I had you know, it's a good a, weekend. A lady that ran our lead off dinner, did all the food. Um, she had a nice restaurant, but I did that a couple times for our team and the parents that were in town is I actually cooked like Easter brunch for them because I worked in, in restaurants growing up. So I actually, okay. I actually would go get food, and uh, we would do a Easter brunch. That was that was actually a cool thing. It was time consuming, but uh, because I could run the kitchen, um, it actually worked out pretty good. We did that a couple years, but we always play. We usually played on Easter, and then we got rained out a couple times. So I actually invited the players and the parents that were in town. To, to eat dinner at a re- eat brunch at a restaurant, it was good. Yeah, you know, and I offer that out to to the guys. Yeah. Um, but pretty much like our, our parents group is great, and they'll kind of get together and talk with the parents and be like, "Hey, is anybody not coming in? Yep. If you're not coming in, like the boys are welcome at my house, and like they're they're really good with that stuff, you know." So, like, on a day like today with practice, like, what will you do with them? You know, being that we're going to play two tomorrow and it's raining here, you know, we'll probably just, you know, we'll get in the cage. You know, we'll do some maintenance work, swing-wise. You know, we'll do some, uh, you know, maybe work, uh, you know, approach-wise, like on what we're going to see maybe this weekend out of the the staff at Mary Mack. If there's anything that we think we need to kind of key in on, uh, we'll do a lot of two machine stuff, like and try to see do some sequencing. Um, you know, some guys that we're going to see. So it, it'll pretty much just be like a maintenance day. Um, a lot of a lot of conversation. Um, you know, and then on the pitching end, you know, same thing. Just you know, touching on the details and you know, pick off work and that kind of stuff. With your two machine, you got them side by side on the mound. Uh, well, no, like the way the the way the um, the uh, hack attack machines, those sports attack machines, are made. You can put them right in front of each other. So, like, yeah. you have the big one and a small one in front of it, and the way they're engineered, like they're at the perfect height where they don't interfere. So, um, you know, we'll do that. We will do some side to side stuff like angle. You know, we'll we'll put two of them on the angle so we could work in and out. Um, we try to get as creative as possible with it. You know. Yeah, that's how we set it up. We'd have the big one behind with breaking balls. And we'd have the small one in front with fastballs. You got two coaches feeding those, yep. or you got one coach? We got one coach feeding it. Um, you know, even the players feed too. Yep, like it. You know, and we do the we do the big machine, um, you know, for the breakables as well because, you know, you want to you want to catch that breakable that pops up out of a guy's hand, yep. um, you know. So that's the kind of stuff we'll do today. Just some maintenance, some approach, some conversations. You know, get some feedback from guys like, hey, how do you feel? Guys have been pitching you. Um, you know, today. We're gonna we're gonna dig into true media today. We're kind of reverse engineering our scouting reports on like yep. how our teams pitching us or how our teams you know or, you know when we're how are the other teams like what, what are the adjustments they're making on us? Um, and, and I kind of feel like on a weekly basis you have to do some of that stuff. Yep. You know, 
Um, but with today being, you know, a rain out day, I, you know, we're going to spend, we're going to spend the whole day in the office kind of digging in on, okay, what are teams doing to our guys right now? You know, how do you balance that with your players though? Cause I, I, I always went round and round with this. So obviously your hitters are going to have some strengths and some weaknesses. And then this time of year, it's like, okay, if we focus too much on your weaknesses, it might send you into a funk. How do you balance that with your hitters? Well, there's so much information available, right? (laughs) And you could really go down a rabbit hole with this stuff. If you give the players full access, Yes, right? So, what I feel like our, our job is to go through the information and then select what we want to give to them and keep it as simple as possible. So, like, if we have a guy who's, you know, striking out away, looking all the time, it's telling me what he's doing approach-wise. So, you know, we could use that information to say, hey, like, with two strikes, like, you really should be looking away because, like, that's how they're getting you out right now. So, like... Instead of you looking in, you got to start to look away and make, you know, a simple adjustment like that. Uh, I think if you give them too much, you will cloud their minds up without a doubt. Um, Or I'm more of a fan of didn't always like this from me, but I'm like, hey, you're a pull guy, which is fine, but you better get your toes on the plate and make that outside pitch more middle for you. Exactly. And those little things can be very helpful to a guy, but it's like anything else, right? Like the player, as a coach, you make suggestions to players. That's the way I feel about it. Like we're giving you a suggestion of what we think is going to help you. It's up to you to accept it. Right. And, and that's the one thing that coaches can't do. Like I cannot make a guy do what I'm asking him to do. He's got to be willing to do it. Yep. So if that player is not comfortable in his own skin with making a change or has a lot of outside influences telling him something different, you know, it, it's a battle that can be become very difficult to navigate. And, um, you know, so for me, I try to really get a full picture and understanding of what's going on in their head and then trying to figure out how I can trick them into what they really should be doing. Exactly. You know, <laughs> exactly. You know, and, and as you know, your approach and your plan, it changes with every time they put a different guy on the mound. Yep. You know, like period. Like if you got a, a lefty summer who just works away to a right-handed hitter and all of a sudden they bring in, you know, a heavy sink, you know, two seam guy that runs into a right hander and that guy's still looking away, like, you know, you got to change constantly, right? And that's, uh, that is what I think the players of today, like, have the most difficult time with is adjusting, not even pitch to pitch. I think it's more they struggle, like, arm to arm. Because it's like, well, my first two at bats, I was look, looking away and I had success. I'm going to look away again, but like now the guy on the mound may be really good on the arm side, not on the glove side. You know, so. I tried I think to get guys to move around players, the box I, just to, to help their approach. And, you know, some guys did it. I, it was funny. The guys that would actually buy into moving around a little bit when they needed, they put up good numbers, but not everybody can do that because obviously they don't see it in the big leagues. So it's like, okay, big league hitters don't do that. I'm like, well, you're not a big league hitter. Uh, You're a college hitter at best. Um, You need to give yourself the best opportunity to get balls on your barrel. And so you may have to move around a little bit to help yourself. You know, as as simple as I can make it to guys, the biggest question, and and I do this with my coaches daily, is what can he do? What can he do? So, like, whoever we're facing, what is he good at? What isn't he good at? You know, like, if he doesn't, if he uses his changeup 10% of the time, then we're going to eliminate the changeup. Like, and if his fastball command is good and he's got a good breakable, then, like, that's what we're going to lock in on. Um, 
if he's 85% fastball, like in a 2 0 count, then like 2 0, it's like we're hunting the fastball. Like we're not, we keep it as elementary as possible. Because you have and, to with hitting. You have to. And, and, and that's to. where you have to you rely know. on your guys to take pitches. Like if you're hunting fastball in that 2 0 count and they throw your breaking ball, then you just got to spit on it. And hopefully. Well, you got to have the confidence yes. enough to spit on it. Yep. Right? You know, and, and that's. That's like something that we, pre- I'm like, Hey, you could be looking for a breaking ball. You can anticipate that that guy's throwing you a breaking ball, but you better stay on your fastball timing. And if you do, you'll be on time for the breaking ball. As long as you have your eyes middle of the zone up and see that thing elevated. If you're swinging at a, a low breaking ball, you're not going to hit it. Like it, it's going to begin low. It's going to be low. Like you got to be able to set your eyes, you know, on that particular pitch at that particular time and have the confidence that if you don't get it, you're not swinging at it. Hey, were you at, you were at Long Island when I was at Iowa, correct? I think we played each other down in Florida. We may have played. Yeah, we did play one time, I think down there uh, at that Russ mat. Yes. You guys had a good club. You guys team was good that year. Yeah. What year was that? If I'm guessing, I want to say 11 or 12. Yeah, 11. We had we had a good team. Yep. You know, um, we we had two big, uh, well, one big big leaguer on that team. Another guy had graduated a year or two before that. Um, but yeah, we had we had a good ball club in 11. That was really kind of the year that turned it around for the program. Um, you know, they hadn't gone to the postseason in like 11 years. Um. And that was like our fourth year. That's when we finally had gotten like we had gotten it turned around, you know. Well, because it, it surprised me because we had played you guys when I was in college down in Florida. When I was a sophomore, my sophomore year, we played LIU down in there, and so your guys' team obviously had changed a lot in you know those fifteen twenty years since you know playing in the nineties, mid nineties, and then turn around and play in the late two thousand tens. Like you guys were were good. It was very pleasant. I appreciate that. Guys. Yeah, very good. Hey, did yeah, you know Tyler? A lot of hard work. and Yeah, I mean, that's part of building a yeah. program. Without a doubt. What, what were you saying? Did you have, you t- me did about you have Tyler? Tyler Willman with the rafters? Tyler Willman? Yeah, he's a Western Illinois. I can't mm-hmm. remember if he actually. No, I did not have him. Because nope. we had a bunch of guys from. He might have been the year before. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He had a big arm. Big arm. Now that I got you. Now that yeah, the year before me, I think they had him and Ben Heller. Yes. Yep. Yep. And Ben's in the big leagues again. Um, good, great guy too. Funny how that works. Yeah, I got to meet him at one of the winter banquets, and we we've, we've stayed in touch over the years. He's just really good person. I was going to ask you what what is an appropriate amount of games for summer ball. It's a loaded question. So, like, <laughs> if you have a – well, if you have a pitcher that got 10 innings, uh, I mean, he needs yes. to go out and throw, you know, 40 to yes. 60 innings in the summer, right? Yep. Um, if you had a guy had 20 at-bats, like, he needs to go somewhere where he could get 150, 200 at-bats, you know, and play. So, it, I think it just kind of depends on, you know, who you're speaking about. Um, every player's development path is a little bit different. Some of the same. Um, I think for hitters and position players, uh, I don't think that you could play enough games. To be I, honest I completely with you. agree with you on that. Where's your cutoff for your guys, your arms? Where's your cutoff inning wise where you're not going to send them out in the summer? Um, you know, like last year, we, we, our top arms, you know, were in the 80 range and we sent them out in the summer for another 20. 25. Um, you know, there were some guys that were freshmen that had about 40 innings that we let them go out and get about 35 in the summer. Um, again, I just think it's on, on the individual guy, but I'm a firm believer of guys got to go out and play. Like, I, I understand what it's like in the recruiting world now, and people are afraid to send their players out, but to me, sending guys out 
is what you're supposed to do for players for their development. Yes. If a guy's going to go out in the summer and have an opportunity to leave your program, like he's going to leave anyway, yes. you still should be doing what's right by the player. Yep. Yeah, and I, I was with you with the arms. It was about 100 innings. I wanted to try to keep it around 100 innings for them between the spring and the summer. And that, and that, you know, those were guys that were going to be juniors, right? Like, yes. we had a, we have a freshman arm, Ryan Bilka, who's really, really good. And last last year, he threw about, you know, 40, 45 innings. I wanted him to get about 30 in the summer. Um, I thought, you know, a 75 number was good, good for him, but 100 was good for our older guys. You know, then what are you doing with them in the fall? Your guy that your guys that throw a hundred innings through the spring and the summer. What are they doing in the fall? You know, they're they're just coming in and trying to work on things. And by the end of the fall, if they throw an inning in, in an inter squad game, you know, a World Series game or whatever, I'm I'm good with that. Uh, if they don't throw, I don't care. Yep. Um, you know, I want them to use that time to develop. Um, you know, they're throwing and throwing bullpens and doing all that stuff. But as far as, you know, game action, you know, they'll throw an inning, maybe two innings towards the back end of our inner squads, you know, or maybe our World Series games. But I don't need them to have a heavy workload, you know, innings-wise in the fall. I need them to, to really be working on their continued development. You, know, you play a really good early schedule. How do you balance that schedule with keeping guys confidence once you're through those first three or four weekends? I, I think we just we talk about it at nauseum, right? Like we talk about what kind of team we want to be, which is a regional team, right? So if you want to be a regional team, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to play those types of teams in June. If we're going to play them in June, let's go play them in February and see what it looks like. This way, when we get to June, we're not surprised by anything. You know, there there isn't any environment that that I don't feel we could bring our players into to where they're going to be intimidated by it. Um, so the way I balance it out is that like we continuously speak about it, and it's like, hey, like it's not about beating these guys in February. Like, yeah, we're going to try and we want to, but like. It's about when we get there in June and winning. Like, it matters a lot more in June than it does in February. So, uh, I think you got to have right, the right people in the locker room that can handle it. And I think we have a pretty mature group. And we've had a, a mature group the last couple of years from a mentality standpoint and self-confidence standpoint. Um, so, that's pretty much how I attack it. Um and then when you when you come back from those trips and like we're ten and three since we came home, right? Yes. And you're eight so and like, one the league. It kind of so, self, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. And I, I was the same way as right. you. Right. It self it self corrects way. itself, right? Yep. Yeah. I was the exact same way. I wanted to challenge our guys, see where we're at, and you maybe had to nurse them a little bit, but obviously once you got to league play, then it was gonna be a little bit different and I would much yeah. rather get challenged early, get punched in the mouth early, and see where you're at, and then make it a little bit easier once you get back home. Yeah, and, and and you know what? Like when we break down the North Carolina weekend, we were three one and five five in the sixth inning in two of those games. So like we could play with like we you know the kid Honeycutt, we struck him out eight times in that weekend. Yep. So like. That showed my pitchers, hey, I could get high-level hitters out, right? So, you know, I think there's a lot of good things that you could take away, you know, from that series. And then, I mean, A&M is A&M, right? Like, Carolina's a really good team, but the difference between Carolina and A&M, to me, was immeasurable because the pitching at A&M was just that much better, Right. Um, you know, and they have three first rounders hitting one, two, three in the order. Like, you know, Carolina's got a really good lineup, but like, they didn't have three guys like that at the top, you know, and so that created like a second challenge that was different than what week one was. Carolina was very balanced, had a little bit more speed, um, you know, a little bit more maybe just contact oriented guys like that could really hurt you on the base paths. 
and A and M had you know star power. <laughs> you know those three guys that at the top are, are special. Um, you know, and and there we are Saturday, like, and I think seventh inning we got bases loaded in a two nothing game with one out. We're one hit away from tying or taking the lead. You know that even when you lose that game two nothing, well, I don't think anybody else has played them as tight the whole year. Um, so to me, that's just something that I really focus on with our guys. Like, Hey, like, look what you did here. Like we put 10 straight zeros up against A and M at one point. So, you know, that tells me a lot about our guys, like in the, the capabilities that they do have to be able to go beat that team on any given day. You ever have a hard time scheduling those those first couple weekends? I mean, your program is good. You j- barely miss the regionals. You ever have a hard time getting people to schedule you? I don't. You know, I don't think any of those teams are worried about you know losing to us early in the year. Um, but I, you know, like Wes Johnson called me from Georgia when he got the job, and he's like, "Hey, like I'm trying to kick my early season schedule up, like." you know, you guys want to come in. And I was like, well, I don't know if we're kicking your early season schedule up, but yeah, like we'd love to come to Georgia and play. Um, you know, and, and one of the things he told me is that he had spoken to Elliot Avent and Avent had told him, Hey man, they came in last year and the first three games of the year, they didn't make any errors and played us like really tough. So like, if you want to, if you want to challenge your team, like they're a good team to bring in because they'll be prepared to play. Um, so I don't think, I don't think any of those guys are worried about losing to us. Um, and I think we, we present ourselves as a good opponent for them because we will, we will play you kind of tough for a while, you know? How much are you able to get on the field early before you start playing? You know, that's weather dependent, obviously. Um, this year we got out a little bit. Last year, we got out more. Um, we didn't have snow last year. This year, we got a little bit of snow at the wrong time. That kind of held us back a little bit. But either way, Brian, you got to be ready, right? You got to do what you can to be as ready as you possibly can. Um, does it play a factor? Without a doubt, it does. Um, you know, I just think from, you know, the on-field reps, you know, just being able to in a squad and run on and off the field, yes. right? If you don't get to, you don't, you know, or be able to in a squad three days in a row to replicate a, a, you know, a weekend. If you don't get to do those things before you do it, well, like now when you're out playing a good opponent early, it's the first time you're running on and off the field nine times. Yes, and long right? toss. I mean, it affects your legs and your arms. And long toss and, and take it in and out yep. and all that stuff. So, yeah, not getting on the field can really have an impact on you. And, you know, I I talk to my coaches about that. I'm like, you guys got to really understand, like, yeah, it's great that the hitters get to face the pitcher and the pitcher gets, you know, to face the hitter. But, like, it's more important that we're running on and off the field. It's more important that we're, you know, getting our communication down. Um, It's better, better that we're moving our defensive players hitter to hitter or, so, like, just from a communication standpoint and game management, that stuff's even more important than the live at-bats. Yes. You know what I mean? Yep. To me, as a head coach. Yeah, because if, you're, that if, stuff's if you way get more somebody important. dinged up with their legs or their arm early, that's going to set them back for a while. Without a doubt. And that stuff's going to happen if you don't get out on the, on the field. You know, but... Just the in-game communication and the situations and putting your bunt defense in or a first and third play and getting everybody on the same page and getting your defense moving the right way, you know, in con- you know, with, with continuity. Like, that stuff's really important um, because now when you go to A&M and there's 8,000 people in the stands and, and it's loud, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult to communicate, right? So... Uh, I think you got to really have the communication down. And and we got caught a time or two early in the year, you know, having a guy in the wrong spot, you know, a, a freshman on the field and, you know, didn't have as many reps. 
you know, and, and we, we got caught one, one or two times on it, but that's going to happen even when you're, you know, prepared at what you think is a really good level, right? Like that stuff, human error is still going to happen, right? Are you using pitch com with your pitchers and catchers? Um, well, to be honest with you, we have the earpiece for the catcher. We don't have anything with the fielders, but I'm in the process of getting that system that has all the, the wristbands. Well, because that's where the, the la- you know, you go play at a place like that, too. Like, it's good for that because it takes the, the audio piece out of it where guys can actually look and they don't have to hear. Right, but when you're when you're a program like us that doesn't necessarily have, let's say the the resources to go spend three thousand on it, um, you know, we have to operate differently, yeah. right? So, you know, I had first sort of system that Vandy uses. Um, we were there two years ago, and when I when I spoke to Coach Corbin and, and Scotty Brown about it, they're like, "Hey, here's a company," and I called the company and. They didn't, they were just beginning production, right? And Vandy was using kind of like a prototype. And now this year we went to ETSU. um, And when we went to ETSU, they were using it. And I I talked to, you know, Joe Panucci, the head coach there. And he's like, yeah, here's a guy. And he gave me the guy's number and the whole deal. So like, I'm in the process now of buying that system because now they have the product available. And I really liked it when I had seen it at Vanderbilt. And what are some other things that people from the outside looking in that don't know a ton about mid-major Division One baseball? I mean, you're on the road recruiting on Monday. You know, what are some other things that, that people maybe don't realize about the mid-major level? Because that, that's in my sweet spot. I'm, I'm, very, I'm diehard mid-major Division One just because I grew up around it sure. and I lived it. So what are some other things that people need to hear about mid-major Division One baseball? You know, I, I, you know, Wagner is a small school, right? We have about 2,200 students. So that means the amount of class options are a lot lower at a place like Wagner than they are at, let's say, NC State, right? So it can be challenging with guys having class during practice times or, you know, traveling for midweek games. You got to leave, you know, 13 guys home because, They have class conflicts. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, some of these schools in the South or out West, I mean, they're playing 40 home games a year, (laughs) right? Like, you know, like, so they don't have the problem with their kids missing class and they have a lot of online options. You know, a place like Wagner, which is a, a smaller school, like we don't, on the academic side, like we're more constricted and it can, it can leak into the baseball at times. Um, they do a really good job here and our academic coordinators are great and the professors will work with you. And, you know, our, our team has been very good academically traditionally. So we, we definitely, you know, we get, we get people to work with us a little bit, but our guys now on a Monday or on a Tuesday, when we're not playing, they're doing more academically to make up for missing a Wednesday and a Thursday. You know, so um, I think that's one of the things that, you know, is different uh, school to school. And, you know, obviously the bigger the school, the more class choices somebody's going to have. Um, but I think we do a pretty good job with it. And by the way, your facility is not mid-major. Your facility is big time. Well, I appreciate that, and I agree with you. Um, you know, but again, that to me, the facility is great. You know, we practice there, we play games there. And if we're not playing there because there's some other people that use the facility and they have other events there, you know, we're still going to Trenton and playing in a AAA ballpark, you know, or we're going to Lakewood and playing in the Phillies by a ballpark. So our administration has done a really good job of, you know, putting us in a position to be in a really good place to play our games whenever we're playing them. Have you dove into the portal much with recruiting? Are you still keeping it pretty 
traditional with high school and then transfers? You know, I, we we have gotten a couple of guys out of the portal, but they're guys that we've had history with. Yeah. Um, you know, it's no secret in today's game that if a kid, whether he's at the Division three level or NAIA or D1, if they have good years, like, they wind up going to larger conferences. Like, it's just the way it is. Um, and I don't blame the players. Like, it's their opportunity to go from being a Division three player to all of a sudden you're playing at Duke, right? Like, I mean, who can argue with that, right? Um, so I think the portal, you know, I think we, we look into more of the guy that we have history with, maybe during the recruiting process or – guys that we've played against that we've seen maybe for a year or two that all of a sudden are in the portal. That could be a good fit for us. Um, and I really, I like the junior college players as well. Um, I think for us, you know, I put together a roster management plan three years ago when I took over and, I, th- I don't think there's one way to do it, Ryan, but I think having a balance of all three, a freshman, Juco, and, and some portal guys can can really give you the right mix and, and keep your ball club always at a little bit of an older age where it becomes a little easier for you to compete. With your time with Bergen Beach, what do youth and travel coaches need to hear right now? The, way, the landscape of what it was 20 years ago and what it is now is completely different. Um, you know, like, you really didn't have many teams around the country like that 20, 25 years ago, right? Um, and now we just have so many teams where the talent is so spread out and so diluted um, that the only thing I could really offer to coaches in today's game is, like, be more concerned with developing your players, not only physically, but mentally, as well as educating them and their parents on what the landscape of college baseball actually looks like. And, and I think that's one of the biggest disconnects right now that we have going on is that, you know, the expectations of players and parents is, not necessarily being communicated with the travel coaches. Like the travel coaches are still trying to tell guys, Hey, you could do that. You could go to the SEC. You could go to the ACC. Um, Instead of saying, Hey, like you're better off going to a mid-major program, you know, like Wagner or Elon or James Madison, where you could get on the field and play. Um, So I, I think, I think the communication between programs and players and parents needs to really jump to the forefront. And I think parents and players have to do their part of listening to the people that are telling them these things. Um, I just heard Pete Hughes talking on, um, I think it was a blue blue book uh, podcast with Walter Beatty, you know, talking about, Hey, like they're in the, they're in the big 12, like, if that high school player can't walk in and make an impact, they're going to the poor little junior college. Like they have no choice. You know, we talked about that on the you D one preview with some of the D one sports writers. And you just said it, look at a and M you got Jace Follett. The guys that are playing as freshmen at the division one level, they are dudes, dudes. It's, yeah, and like especially UNC, a school like that, those guys, those guys turn down money in the draft, and probably are going to be big leaguers. That's who they're competing against at schools like that, where most parents right. and, and players don't want to hear that now. And especially coming from your travel coach, that's a hard conversation for parents to listen to because they don't want to hear it, but they need to hear. It. It's like okay. These are the guys that are playing at freshmen and those those top fifteen programs. Those guys could go play in minor league baseball right now, not just be good college players. They'd be good minor league baseball players right now. They would, and, and like I, I don't really want to talk about other teams, but like UNC had two guys on the field, the freshman catcher and the center fielder Honeycutt, 
they were the only two guys that came into that program as freshmen. Yes. Every other guy on the team was a transfer. And Honeycutt's probably going to be a first rounder. No doubt. He's a good player, right? Like, he's a great player, great athlete. But, like, the point is, even at North Carolina, every other guy on the field was a transfer. Yes. You know, at, at, at A&M, like, Lavalette was a freshman. Gro- Grohovic was a freshman. You know, a lot of those other guys are Juco or four-year transfers. Yeah. Portal guys. Um, it's just the way the game is now. And if, if you're a power five and you don't have an older team on the field, you're going to really struggle. You took kind of a unique path to get to where you're at now because you did spend so much time in summer ball you know, you don't see it as much. Usually guys are out on the on the road recruiting in the summertime. I mean, who who kind of said, hey, just keep doing this to, to stay on that path? Because it's kind of unique for right now. Well, the guy, the gentleman who was a head coach here before me, Jim Carone, who's at McDaniel right now in, in that Centennial League. Um, Jim, you know, Jim was like, hey, like in the summer, like, Keep doing what you're doing because, like, we don't have the budget for you to go on the road, and I know you, you're going to want to be out every day. Yep. And, you know, financially, you know, we don't have a full-time assistant coach here, right? So Tim's like, I really can't pay you. You're making great money. and Like, just keep doing that. Like, it's better for our program for you to keep doing that, and you continue to make connections and – I mean, hey, I'm watching players in that league, right? So, like, I'm seeing junior college players, um, you know, as I'm managing games. So, like, that was Jim's thing. Like, he didn't want to take it away from me, you know, and have me, you know, going out on the road two days a week and twiddling my thumbs all summer, you know, because we didn't have the recruiting budget, let's say. Um, That is, you know, definitely changed. You know, but at the time, that's what it was. And to be honest with you, and I, I, I spoke about this in the article a little bit. You know, we were playing 75 games a summer. You do that for six years. It's another, you know, 450 games or whatever it is. That's another nine college baseball seasons. I, you know, it's just so much experience. I loved in a, my in a five short years period doing of time. it. I, lo- I loved it. And it did add. It added so much more game experience that I needed at that point as a young coach. I loved my five summers of doing it. I loved it. Right. And, and I wasn't a young coach, right? But it, it had been a long time since I was responsible for managing a pitching staff and game management and running the offense and, you know, recruiting the roster and, you know, learning how to, deal with kids that you don't know, right? Like, you know, Northwoods on day one, you got 35 guys in a locker room that you don't know. So the biggest thing you got to do is build a relationship with those guys, right? That takes time. And then you got another guy coming in and another guy. And, um, you know, and then playing that game schedule, you know, you got to really learn how to manage your pitching staff, right? Um, Because in college, you know, we play Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then maybe you play on a Tuesday or Wednesday and you get days off and it's kind of static, right? When you're playing six, seven games a week, it's not so static anymore when, you know, your number three starter goes out and, and gives up eight in the first inning and it blows your whole pitching staff up for three or four games, yep. right? Like, you got to you gotta constantly know how to manage that aspect of it, right? Did that get any so, easier um, for you, the amount of time you spent in the Northwoods League? Did that part get easier for you? Yeah. I just, you know, what what you had to do is come up with a system. And, you know, you had to come up with a pitch counting and day's rest. And, you know, you got to have the history of the player. Like, what role did you pitch in this year at, at your school? You know, so, like, if it was a guy who was a bullpen guy that would throw – you know, three times a week, then you kind of had an idea of how you could use that guy. If it was a guy who was a starter, but now he's out by you and he's got an innings limitation, like you got to use that guy differently and he's not used to being a, a reliever, right? So I think like anything else, it takes a little bit of time to 
to really find out, uh, you know, figure out some kind of a formula. And then the formula always changes based on your personnel. Um, but I'd say it took that, that first summer to really, you know, have a general idea of how I should approach it. Do you have a fail forward moment? Do you have something you thought was going to sidetrack you, but looking back now, it helped you move forward? Um, I mean, I, I think we all do, right? Like we all have things that, that happen that make us say, well, I learned from that, right? And when you've been around the game, as long as I've been around the game, I, I think there's so many things that happen to you over the years that shape you into the coach that you are. Um, you know, and when I was a young coach, I spent so much time wanting players to be what they, what I wanted them to be. And over time, you learn that players are going to be what they are, not what you want them to be. So you have to learn to, you know, in that case, like you got to learn to control the emotional part of it, right? Like we invest so much time in a young man and we believe in him so much that when he doesn't do it, it can be frustrating to you. And you have to be able to take that step back and understand that, like, you don't control a certain amount of that development that player does. So there's only so much you can do, you know, to get a player going where, you know, you want him to go where you think he could go. And then that player's got a responsibility in that, in that formula as well. I mean, what would, what do you, what else do you wish you would have known before you got into coaching? Oh man, before I got into coaching. Yeah. Um, what do you wish somebody would have told you before you got into coaching? Besides that, well, that that's a good piece. I mean, well, I, I think all coaches struggle with that part because you do invest so much time well, in players. You think they should just be able to go out and do it, and, and there's a timeline to that. Well, there is, and everybody's everybody's got a different – everybody learns at a different pace, right? So, for sure, but, you know, one of my biggest mentors was Fred Hill, the legendary coach, obviously, from Rutgers. And, you know, I asked Coach Hill early on, like, if you give me one piece of advice, like, what would it be? And he just told me, hey, the day you think it's about you, like, get out. It's not about you. It's about your players. So, like, if you ever find yourself thinking that, like, it's about you, you need to get out. I mean, I think to a coach, uh, all of us that have been in this for a while, we can point to those one or two older coaches that took us under their wings that we owe everything to. Sure. How are you, how are you paying doubt. that back? I mean, who, what, what guys besides your assistants are you kind of taking on your wing a little bit? Uh, you know, Austin Heenan at Salisbury. You know, him and I have a very good relationship and – uh, Brink Ambler, who's now a hitting coordinator um, with the Baltimore Orioles. Joe Homaker, at, who's now the pitching coach at Princeton, was in pro ball for a couple of years with Baltimore before that. Um, Devin DeYoung, who's a hitting coordinator with the uh, Chicago White Sox. Uh, he's another guy you know, that I had out in the Northwoods that, that really went on to you know, these guys have gone on and, you know, really done well within the game and, and forged some really good paths for themselves. Um, been a lot of local guys, some travel guys, you know, that I, I speak to, you know, a lot. Um, high school coaches, you know, young high school coaches, just really anybody who, who kind of reaches out for help, I'll, I'll try to help in any way I can, you know, and sometimes, I can help them and I'll recommend somebody better, you know, for their particular problem. What are the biggest questions you're getting from the high school coaches right now? Cause I have a lot of high school and travel coaches that reach out. What are, what are the biggest questions that you're getting from the high school guys? I, I think it's really, how do I, how do I navigate or mitigate like the expectations of parents? <laughs> yep. You know, and, you know, I, I'll take you back to Coach Hill. Years ago, like I had a two-way kid, you know, and who was going to have a future on the mound. 
um, wound up actually getting to the big leagues, you know, and the dad was consumed with him playing shortstop when he wasn't pitching, <laughs> you know, and I said that I talked to coach Hill about it. I said, Hey, like, how do I handle this? And he was like, he goes, give them a permission slip to hurt their kid. I go, what? He was like, when the dad comes in and go, Hey, how come he's not playing short? Go hang on a minute. He goes and hand him a piece of paper that says, Hey, you give me permission to hurt your son. It's like, Hey, just sign that. And I'll play him at short because like, he's going to get hurt if I do that. But if you're okay with me hurting him, then, and, and I'm not going to have any liability, then, Hey, just sign this and I'll play him at short. And he said, like, the parent will never look at you or say anything to you again. And it worked as ridiculous as it was. He, it was coach Hill's way of saying, Hey, like sometimes you got to shock somebody with something so ridiculous for them to see that you're actually trying to help their kid. And that's great advice for, for every travel high school coach out there right now that you don't normally think about. And sometimes if, you know, parents don't know, like they, they want what's best for their kids, but they don't understand workload management and those things. And that's a great way to, great way to reframe the workload management is like, hey, you don't think about this, but I have to think about this. And this is where I'm coming from on this, on this issue. Yeah, without a doubt. I, I think the communication aspect, you know, can be better. And I know it's a balancing act for a lot of programs there. They're charging, you know, significant fees and, you know, it's warranted. Like, you know, the amount of time that these guys invest with their programs and the travel, you know, and the, and the cost of tournaments and, you know, the whole deal. I, I'm not saying what they're charging isn't, you know, isn't proper. It probably is. But with, with that, when people are paying that money, they kind of feel like they can tell you what's best for your kid for the, with, you know, for their kid, I should say. And it's not really, it's not the way it goes. And I think that's the difficult thing is, well, Hey, I paid you to do this for my kid and you're not doing it for my kid, but they don't look at the other, the other variables of the equation. Well, I, not just tournament, but most of them have facilities now. So they're, they're getting to use facilities. There's a lot of cost that goes into all of that. And I think the game of baseball is in great shape. You know, obviously, if you look at, at social media, people won't say that. But I think the game of, of baseball is in great shape because of what we've done on the youth and the travel side with the youth and travel coaches. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with you. I think there's a lot of travel programs out there that do a really good job, you know. But even the ones that do really good jobs, they're kind of like, you know, a band at a wedding. You know, there's going to be X amount of people in a room that didn't like the, the band and they wanted a DJ, right? And, you know, same thing with a travel program. Like, there's going to be a lot of kids that, you know, commit to colleges and there's going to be kids that don't and they have to blame somebody, right? You have any morning or evening routines you go to? Um, I'm up at 4.30 in the morning. You said that. You said that on the pre-call. I love it. You and I are kindred yep. spirits. Um, Have you always been that way? Have you always gotten up that early? You know, my dad passed away when I was 10 years old. So as a kid, if I wanted anything, I, I had to work. And that could have been a morning paper route. It could have been shoveling snow or cutting grass or, you know, helping a neighbor with something. Um, there were many jobs that I did. So I guess from a young age, I was used to getting up early and as an athlete, you know, you got 8 a.m. doubleheader or 9 a.m. doubleheader. So like you got to get up early, got to travel, um, you know, and then you got to come home and go to work. So like I would say for the time I'm, I was like 13 or 14 till now, I've always had a busy schedule. So my body is just used to get up early and getting going, you know, I love the quote, if you want something done, ask a busy person to do it. Yeah, it makes sense. Because they're, they're used to managing their time. Yeah. You know, and, and you see it, 
you know, even with your student athletes, like I try to get that across to every single one of our guys, you know, about how like, like the status quo is not going to get it done. You need to do more, you know, you need to do more. And the other day we had two alumni come in who are, are doing really well in the, in the business world. And they talked with our team, you know, and they just kind of said that to them too. Like, Hey, when you graduate, don't think, okay, I graduated. Like, I'm, I'm going to get a job and I'm good. Like when you get a job, like you're going to have to put your time in. Like when you first get into the business world, you're going to have a six to 10 year period where you're going to have to, you're going to have to do more to set yourself up. for when you get into your early to mid thirties, that's when you're going to really begin to make, make the money after you're, you know, six to 10 years in, you know, but you're going to have to really work hard when you first get into the industry, it never ends. And I feel stagnant. If if I get some downtime, I'm not good with downtime. I'm terrible with it. If I get some downtime, I, I feel very stagnant if I get out of my routine. Yep. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, like, at the end of this weekend, you know, I kind of I kind of felt myself, you know, thinking certain, th- certain things about our team, you know, and after the fact going, you know, you dummy, like you just played a good team with good left-handed pitching. Like it was just, you know, they were good too. You know, instead of me saying, Hey, there was something wrong with our guys. I mean, it were not there wasn't, we won two out of three on the weekend against a, a very good program, you know, who beat us in the championship last year at their place. Like sometimes, you know, nothing was wrong. You actually played good baseball, you know, and you played against a good opponent who did some things that, you know, offset what you thought your players should be able to do, you know? Have you always had that internal dialogue? Have you always been able to reframe your internal dialogue? Yeah, I think you have to because... That's an unbelievable skill that I don't think most people have. Yeah, if you can take inventory on a daily basis of what's going on, with your players, your coaches, your program, your administrators, uh, I don't think you stand the chance to be successful. All right, I know you're. I know you're busy. What are some final thoughts before I let you go? I just think what you guys are doing with Inside Pitch and ABCA, I just think is fantastic. Um, you know the the work that goes in on a daily and yearly basis by you guys. I, I couldn't even begin to fathom. And, you know, as I, I told one of the travel program directors recently, you know, like we're ambassadors of the game, you know, he's in business, right? We're not in business. We're, we're trying to grow the game. They're trying to grow their business. So I just think I did travel programs college coaches, high school coaches. I think they, the communication has got to continue to get better. And I think we all have to listen to each other more to understand what everybody is going through to make it better. And I think with Inside Pitch and ABCA and the convention, I think coaches that don't go to convention or don't log in and, and listen to it online, they're doing a great disservice not only to themselves and their personal growth, but also to their parents, their players, and the game overall. 